if you already know about Fiasco, I put time codes in the description below for you to just jump to where I talk about the most recent, second edition of the game. However, if you don't know about Fiasco, oh my god, where have you been? This is a great GM-less tabletop role-playing game that I've been playing throughout the pandemic. Within this small book is all the rules you and a few friends will need to play a story that is very similar to a Coen Brothers movie. This game is not for kids. The characters may not get what they want, they may even die, or even lose their treasured possessions. But the true treasured possession is the story and friends we made along the way. You also need two different colors of dice, preferably one that is brighter than the other. In the book, it's white and black, a good amount of index cards, and of course, markers to write with. I will tell you right now, after these rules, you may not get how the game works or how it's even fun, though you may be interested. I will do my best to explain what makes this game so great, though I fully suggest taking a look at a playthrough to see how it works in person. My personal recommendation is Fiasco Knots by Easy Allies. You can view them on YouTube or where podcasts are available right now. Now, I'll just do a quick run through of this game with this edition, the, the book version if you want to call it, or version one. Each player will have a character. To start with character creation, a handful of dice will be rolled. The amount depends on the amount of players you have. Each die will count as a number based on the number on the top facing side. One by one, each of you will pass around the book to choose the relationships the characters of neighboring players will share. This brings out what kind of person a character can be. There's a top category that will need to be chosen along with what the actual relationship is. However, you can only choose a number if you have that available number from the dice you rolled earlier. Once you've used that die, put it to the side in a discard pile. And one more thing, you can only choose one item at a time. Hence, you may not have full control over your character creation. You may see one relationship that you're really excited to play as, however, your neighboring player may pick something else, or actually anyone. Anyone at the table can choose a relationship for the characters, as long as it hasn't been fully defined with the topic category and what the actual relationship is. Once all the relationships are done, you also pick a location that's important to a pair of characters, an object that is important to another pair, and the need that a pair of characters will share as well. Once again, a different set of characters. That's for a three player game. Depending on the amount of players will determine what you will need to fill out. Now, at this point in the explanation, you are probably realizing that this is not a game where you individually have much control over character creation, even for your own character. And that's the point. This isn't a game where you're going to be the hero. It's called Fiasco for a reason. The definition of that word is a complete failure. Failure, like my English. The game wants you to tell a story with your friends about people working for what they want, and it goes completely wrong. And those are the key words, with your friends. When it comes to Fiasco, I enjoy myself a lot more when players are all in on their character relationships and other details. This only works when the players are talking to each other and throwing out ideas. I tell you right now that this is more of an improv game than anything, albeit a great improv game. It's a game where you have to embody the characters, come up with ideas, and tell a story that you have to introduce and throw to other players and hope they catch it, or at least take it in a very interesting direction. Once character creation is done, everyone writes their characters' names, put the dice back in a big pile, and then starts with whoever grew up in the smallest town. When it is your turn, you will do one of two things. You can establish a scene where you tell where your character is, what they're doing, and who's with them, or you can resolve a scene where someone else at the table will set up where your character is and all those details. Typically, the scene is set up in a way that you will drive your character closer to fulfilling their need, or in some way drive the plot forward. You're gonna roleplay your characters talking to each other in scenes. At times, someone may need to play a minor character for a scene, like this is some sort of high school drama club that only has four members, for this 17 character cast list of Murder on the Orient Express. At some point, your character will try to aim for something that they want in the scene, such as trying to get a partner in this bank robbery heist that you're planning. However, you may or may not get it. If you as a player decided to establish the scenes, the other people at the table will try to slide a die to you in a way to make it noticeable, though not disrupt the scene. If it's the lighter color die, your character gets what they want with a positive outcome. If it's the darker color die, then your character doesn't get it with a somewhat negative outcome. 
However, if you chose to resolve the scene, you decide the outcome. The scene ends after the outcome is played out and someone calls scene. Then the next player clockwise goes. That's how a majority of the game goes for most of it. The only thing that changes over time is the dice mechanics. These dice determine how your character will end up at the end of the game. Whenever someone gives you a die for a scene, at the end of the scene, you will then give that die to someone else at the table. Now that is only for act one. Once everyone has had two scenes, the game has you determine the tilt, basic scene enhancer for the story that can lead to a new way for the story to unfold. Then act two starts, where if you get a die, you keep it. After everyone gets another two scenes, you'll then determine how your character got out of this disaster in the aftermath. Abstract Algebra 1. Here you roll all the dice in front of you. After you take the difference between the color with the higher number and the color with the lower number, then look at what you have left, take a look at the book, then see how bad of a shape your character is in. I say how bad because everything is horrible unless you got a lot of one color. Everyone will take one last scene to give their character an epilogue of what happened after all of this. And that's the game. Now I love this game because once you know how to play it, it gets to be a lot of fun. While you're still working for your character to get what they want, winning and getting a great outcome is not the purpose of this game, it's more telling a fun story. I have learned to come into this game with no expectations of the story, just coming up with stuff on the fly and having fun time playing the minor characters in scenes along with just accepting that a story is going off the rails. This game is also really versatile in the genre of stories that you could want to tell. It has no set setting, instead it has play sets that have different character relationships, locations, objects, and basically everything that you need if you want to tell a different story based on some other theme, all in these different books and online. This game also only takes about 4 hours or less. This is the length of my usual D&D session, hence it is a great replacement game to play when someone is unable to make it. You still get to roleplay and tell a humorous dark story like American Psycho or Mamma Mia. I fully recommend Fiasco with about two caveats. If you have no interest in improv storytelling and roleplaying games like this, this is not the game for you. Simple as that. However, if you are interested, though you do not have that much experience with this kind of game, I do not recommend jumping straight into this game as a completely green beginner. I'm going to recommend again to watch some people play it beforehand to get a feel of the game and how it should play. Then go ahead and play it. Now we get to Fiasco 2nd Edition. This is the box that the 2nd Edition of Fiasco comes with. With this edition you don't need any external pens, dice, or index cards. Everything is in the box. And if you miss books, the box comes with a book. It's the rule book, but it's still a book. Fiasco 2nd Edition has a similar setup, though instead of dice, you have cards. A playset now has its own deck. The box will come with three of them unless you have the Kickstarter version, which, full disclosure, I did back and got as a reward some extra playsets. All relationships, locations, objects, and needs are now on the cards, which will be shoveled into a big pile and divided among the players. Then, similar to Fiasco 1st Edition or Book Edition, players will take turns placing relationship cards from their hands and place them between two neighboring players. You can pass if you don't have a relationship card or one that doesn't inspire you. After all of that is in place, you'll then do the needs, location, and objects as well. Then before playing, flip the cards over, pick two names to make a full name like Meg and Bobby, or a single card if they only have one name like Gomez. The rest of the game plays out pretty much the same with some minor differences. You now have outcome cards that work the same as the dice. Once again you'll have to adjust the amount based on the amount of players. Players will now keep their outcome cards at all times until the end, before the resolution and finding out how the characters did, as players have a chance to give one of their outcome cards to another player to shift the balance of chance. Tilts are also determined via your cards, and two of them can now come into play during the story. Also, if two players have the same aftermath number, whoever comes first in the order gets that aftermath, while the next person with that number gets the next lowest value. As for what my thoughts are on this edition, I like the idea of this edition. Everything in a box is a complete game with condensed tuck boxes, there's reference cards, a mat that restates the basic flow of the game, the tuck boxes fit snugly into the case, 
There's a card that has what they call kickers to give ideas of scenes. And thank you developers so much for a Let's Not card. Fiasco, like any storytelling game, can get dark, especially to a point where players may not feel comfortable with the situation. Hence, the Let's Not card. If any player, for any reason, tap the Let's Not card, it's time to rewind and change the story, no questions asked. The first edition of Fiasco didn't have anything as clear and as helpful to safety guidelines in tabletop roleplaying. It's nice to see this implemented and even put into the map. As for things I don't like, let's go with the small stuff first. I do not like the tuck boxes, or at least the designs on them. They have a minimalistic design icon on both the box and the cards. I understand why they did it. It's simpler to see the cards and keep them organized, and it'll probably be easier to sell as decks instead of books as well. Though I miss the art that the book had for each playset. The book's art gave more character to the playsets than the box design. The tuck boxes sent with the game are also difficult to open. Anytime I'm trying to open one of these for the first time, I feel like I'm gonna rip the box. And I like to try to keep my cards organized, from playing cards to other tabletop RPG cards. And these cards feel fine. Not horrible, though not great. Just fine. Yet the biggest issue I have with this edition of the game, sadly, is using these cards during setup process. When it comes to having a hand of cards, there's this general notion that comes from most card games that you're not supposed to talk about the cards in your hand. Because of that idea, my friends and I don't usually talk about what we have in our hands during this version of Fiasco. When you have the Fiasco book, you tend to look at all locations and the objects and everything in the playset because you still have to make some choices. You have to look between the book and the available dice you have in order to see what looks good, like a fancy restaurant menu where you can have it your way, if it's available. This overall helps give an idea of the story and leads to more out loud discussions. Hey, for our character relationships, do you want to be friends of a friend? That seems like it could be interesting. Oh, yeah, I was actually looking at that one, or do we still have a one? Yeah, what about an enemy of an enemy? That seems like it would be interesting. You know what? Let's do that. Let's do that one instead. My players and I sometimes even read all the locations in the playset out loud to give us an idea of where we can go in this story. However, here in 2nd edition, we are just placing the cards down, and that's it. We are no longer making a story together. We now have to completely improv a story together. Now, sure, we could try to read everything out loud, and it has been something that was noted, yet we still forget about it. This may be easier if we were in person and can actually share the cards, though due to the world situation, we have been playing the Roll20 version of the game. Yes, there is a Roll20 module that you can purchase for this game. It takes a little bit of time to set up, and I've had issues with the playsets loading, though in the end, it works fine. It also lacks a Let's Not card, however, it is still in the rules to let everyone pay attention to the phrase, Let's Not, both in voice and in the chat. There's nothing that makes the online Roll20 version the definitive version to buy, just makes it more widely available to play, especially under social distancing guidelines. Now, I cannot recommend Fiasco 2nd Edition, because many of the issues I have with this edition of the game are solved in the 1st Edition book, and the things I like about 2nd Edition, I can do with the 1st. I can make a Let's Not card and make it loud and predominant in order players to know it's there. I can play Fiasco online. There are resources still available to do that, along with a lot of community playsets. If you want a more improv style and just make up a story on the spot, then at that point, I do suggest taking a look at Fiasco 2nd Edition. Though, I would also suggest taking a look at Primetime Adventures. While not as easy to set up and play as Fiasco 2nd Edition, as it also requires some external materials, Primetime Adventures does have a Game Master role, however, there is still a lot of collaborative world building that is used for players to build a TV show instead of a Coen Brothers movie. There's also a way to set up a random TV show to play with using their specialty cards or just using a regular 52 deck of playing cards with Jokers removed. However, when it comes to Fiasco, I'm going to stick with the Fiasco book. It so far has brought me far more laughs, enjoyment, and collaboration than the box second edition. That's all I got for now, guys. If you like what you saw, make sure you give this video a like and share this video. If you played Fiasco and Fiasco second edition, the box version, let me know what you think of the games down in the comments below or other improv storytelling games like this. I'm always interested to find new games as well. 
If you guys want to support the channel, I got a Patreon and a coffee set up where I'll be putting up videos a little bit earlier and pulls up so that you guys decide what's the next video I work on. Links for those in the description below. If you want to see that next video, make sure you hit that subscribe button and hit the bell as well in order to be notified when it actually comes up. Other than that, I'll see you guys next time.